Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. When I got the appetizer, I, uh, I laughed to myself because we spoke about this in our men's meeting that we have on Mondays, <coughs> these particular verses. And it's just a peculiarity of where we are in our culture that there are people that don't understand God's creation of nations. That God in His plan and His purpose in His sovereign will has established nations. He creates them and He destroys them. And He does that as He stretches His arm out across His people. God has placed every single one of us in this nation at this time with a plan and a purpose which is to do His will. And His will for all mankind which is the prescription from the great physician which is repentance and faith. And that's even for the child of God. But he's given us his will to preach his word, to bring his truth, to love our neighbors. And that's the mark of a Christian. That in this land that people would see people that are like Jesus. So that's his plan and purpose for establishing nations and moving his arm out across the nation. And looking forward to what our brother has to say here more about this from what this particular piece of scripture I'll be reading in a few minutes. But we need to understand that. There's, there's truth in the doctrine of the nations that we submit ourselves to the truth of what God has done as revealed from His Word. So brothers and sisters, join your hearts with me in prayer. So Father in Heaven, Lord of the nations, we stand in awe, Lord, of what you can do. Lord, in your word it says, can a nation be born in a moment? And the answer is yes, by the sovereign hand of God Almighty. So Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you have done this mighty work. Lord, that we have the liberty that you established before us, Lord. We, Lord, we're living in a land and in a place that is throwing your name to the ground. Lord, it is turning from all your precepts, turning from your established rule, Lord, to follow man's folly. Lord, raise up a generation, Lord, that is strong in your word and in your truth and is unashamed of the gospel, that preaches the gospel that comes with power, and that power is designed to change men into the image of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, raise up people out of this church, Lord, that believe this truth. That the power of the gospel would wash over us, Lord, that first and foremost we would be changed and conformed to your image. And in that truth, Lord, we would bring it to the nation. So, Lord, thank you, Lord, for your blessing and mercy upon us, Lord, by opening our eyes to the truth of who you are and what, we, what we've done, Lord. We were helpless without you. We were dead in our sin and transgression. But God, who's rich in mercy, made us alive. And Lord, for anyone who does not know you, Lord, I pray that the power of who you are and what you've done for them would wash into their soul right now. Lord, that they would see that they're the only hope, that you, Lord Jesus, are the only hope for mankind. We praise your holy name for this mercy and revealing this truth to man. We pray for our president and his cabinet, Lord, that have been struck by the plague. Lord, in your sovereign hand, you sent the plague. And Lord, in your sovereign hand, you will remove it. No amount of hand washing or face covering can remove the plague that you've sent, though we be wise to follow wisdom. So Lord, create in us a greater hope this morning, Lord, from your word. The truth that passes all understanding, only the wisdom that comes in the fear of the Lord. Lord, I pray that your truth would come in power this morning, with understanding, with wisdom. Lord, and that power would change us. And Lord, you are the great physician. You are the great physician, the only one that can heal sick souls. And Lord, your prescription for each and every one of us is repentance and faith. So, Lord, may we take that prescription, Lord, every single day to help heal sick souls that we have. Lord, that we would continually move forward to follow your will and your way, Lord, and to bring 
and your reflected glory to a lost and dying world. So bless us in this way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So brothers and sisters, I have the privilege of reading to you some amazing truth from God's Word. It is going to be 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 through 22. And if you're able, can you please stand for the reading of God's Word? When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me faithfully as David your father did, and do all I command, and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor to rule over Israel. But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you, and go off and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and I will reject this temple that I have consecrated for my name, and I will make it a byword, an object of ridicule among the people. This temple will become a heap of rubble. All who will pass by it will be appalled and say, Why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? And people will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors who brought them out, out of Egypt and embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. This is why he has brought all this disaster upon them. May God bless the reading of his word of your soul. You may be seated. heavy-duty warning, <laughs> heavy-duty um, words there. Again, um, we're taking a short departure from looking at the attributes of the Lord. Um, due to the time, due to the hour, due to the need, um, the great need for our nation, for our country, God put a heavy burden on my heart uh, this past week for this verse. 14, and um, and where we are as a country, and and you hear so much um, of all that's going on around us. It's been like uh, no time that we've ever seen uh, in the history of this country, and there is um, it's really a matter of the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness, uh, a conflict there, and. Um, 
So the title of the message really is God's remedy for our country and his promise to his people. And the central idea is very simple, you know, from 2 Chronicles 7, 14, God calls his people to pray and repentance. So Lord Jesus, again, help us to see the truth here in this verse. And not to just look out at the social unrest, although there's social unrest. Not just go out and look at the lies and deception that are going on around in our culture, but there, even though there is. And not go out around looking at all the uh, difficulties that we're facing as a nation with a pandemic and with um, political hatred on both sides, total division there, Lord, but to see you in the midst of this and, and what our responsibility is as Christians. Lord, help us even to put some of that other stuff aside to see what our responsibility is as Christians. And we pray, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ, he would be magnified and he would shine through um, this hour as we look at this passage together. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we have here Solomon's prayer. Brother John read, and I'm not going to look at every single one of the verses, I'm going to look mostly at 14 and other related scripture and some other verses in the context there. But we got Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple, which uh, was built after his father David's death. And just for a little background here from the verses that John read, second, well, actually in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, we really have to read 6 and 7 together. Maybe we could do that um, today, uh, later on today, in the quietness of our homes, if we turned off the Twitter and uh, all the other stuff, um, we might be able to do that. 2 Chronicles 6, verses 7 through 11, uh, let me just read that. Now, it was in the heart of my father David to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build a house, but your son, who will be born to you, he shall build a house for my name. That will be Solomon. Now the Lord has fulfilled his word which he spoke, for I have risen in the place of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised and have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have set the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord which he made with the sons of Israel. So here's Solomon saying here he is in place of his father David and he had built, rebuilt, built the temple. And then he gives in in 2 Chronicles 6, I'm going to read 12 through 17, his prayer of dedication, it ties right, right into chapter 7. Then he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands. Now Solomon had made a bronze platform, five cubits long, five cubits wide, and three cubits high, and had set it in the midst of the court, and he stood on it, knelt on his knees in the presence of the assembly of Israel, and spread out his hands toward heaven. He said, O Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing loving kindness to your servants who walk before you with all their heart, who, have, who has kept with your servant David, my father, that which you promised him. Indeed, you've spoken with your mouth and have fulfilled it with your hand, as it is this day. Now, therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, keep with your servant David, my father, that which you promised him, saying, you shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your sons take heed to their walk, the way to walk in my law, as you have walked before. Now therefore, O Lord, the God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David. And he continues again, all here in 2 Chronicles 6. I'm going to just read 24 and 25. If your people Israel are defeated for an enemy, because they've sinned against you, and they return to you and confess your name and pray and make supplication before you in this house. Then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people, Israel, bringing them back to the land which you've given to them in their forefathers. 
And then it's down to 40 and 42. Now, O oh God, I pray, let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. Now, therefore, arise, O oh Lord God, to your resting place. You and the ark of your might, let your priests, O oh Lord God, be clothed with salvation. And let your godly ones rejoice in what is good. O oh Lord God, do not turn away your face of your anointed. Remember your loving kindness to your servant, David. And then that leads into chapter 7. And we got this call here in verse 14 to God's people to pray and repent. And we see in calling his people to prayer and repentance, we'll see, we see God hears, God forgives, and God heals. Look down there now at 2 Chronicles 7, 14, verse that uh, you all are familiar with, and we love this verse. Um, and my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. God hears. I just read from the NASB, maybe a better translation here is the King James where it says, if, instead of and, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, the promise, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. So we all know who God is calling to repentance here. He's not calling President Trump to repentance. He's not calling former Vice President Biden to repentance. He's not calling Nancy Pelosi to repentance, Chuck Schumer to repentance, Jerry Nadler to repentance, Congress, the Senate. He's calling us, <laughs> the church, his people, to repentance. He's not calling Republicans or Democrats or politicians to repentance. He's calling God's people, if my people who are called by my name. So they had, the, the, the difficulty here is when God's people turn their back on the Lord, when God's people just go with the flow of everything that goes on around them, and um, the Lord is not first and foremost in their lives. So in this passage, God is calling his people to repentance. How many watched the prayer march last Saturday with Franklin Graham? That was just awesome. That was just awesome. And um, hopefully it's not just a one-time deal. Hopefully God's people are calling out to him in repentance and faith. Because there's a lot at stake. There really is a lot at stake right now. And my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves. So I hope we have... A tremendous sense of appreciation here this morning. It says, and my people who are called by my name. I hope we have a tremendous sense of appreciation in the fact that we are God's people. Right? If we are saved, if we do truly belong to him, and how we have become God's people. Right? Through the blood of Christ, through, through nothing that we've done or earned, but through his awakening us and his speaking to our heart. And everything out of the Christian life flows out of a grateful, grateful, grateful appreciation for what God has done in saving us. And you see people who go shipwreck of their faith, you know, like maybe they follow for a little period of time, or maybe a short period of time, or a longer period of time, but they make shipwreck of their faith if they've not truly been called and truly have been saved. And let me just give another little sidebar why discipleship is so important for a new believer. How a person starts in their Christian life has every indication of how they finish well or if they even finish at all. Amen. Anyways, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves. We've been called, brothers and sisters. And because we've been called, here we have this challenge to God's people to humble themselves and pray. And the precursor um, to repentance is in this verse. <laughs> it's humility. It's humility. And you know, before a person can even be saved, there has to be humility. There has to be a bending of the knee and the will, and there has to be a recognition of sin and recognition of falling short of his glory and recognizing one needs to 
repent when needs in humility to repent. And only God can humble that heart, that hard heart. Humility. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and then pray and seek my face. So God calls his people to pray and seek his face. And that's a gladdening and that's a glorious truth that we have here. That we can pray and seek God's face. Scripture is packed with the blessing that come in prayer. Psalm 5, verse 2. Heed the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you will hear my voice. In the morning I will order my prayer to you and eagerly watch. Psalm 10, verse 17. So many admonitions for prayer. O Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear. What a beautiful, beautiful picture there. The Lord in the universe is bending down, reclining his ear to hear the prayers of his children. Isaiah 65, verse 2. I spread out my hands. Here's the Lord speaking. I spread out my hands all day long to rebellious people who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts. I can really make a mess of things when I follow my own thoughts. Verse 24 of Isaiah 65 says, It will come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. So that encouragement to pray, if my people who are called by my name will pray, humble themselves and pray, and seek my face. And I'm just going to read one verse. I don't have to read any verses to convince any believer in Christ here that God answers prayer. I'll just give one. For my, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. Psalm 118, verse 5. In my distress. Or like, um, I forget what psalm it is. Maybe it's Psalm 107. You're tossed to and fro and you're going back and forth. And you reach the point of your wit's end. I think pretty sure that's Psalm 107. Yeah, look up Psalm 107. See if you look up wit's end. Wit's end and see what, if any, what verse we can come up. I think it's in Psalm 107. You come to your wit's end. You know, when you're at your wit's end, there's nowhere else to go. There's no one else to turn. You've done everything in your own power, in your own strength. You're just broken and at your wit's end. You cry out to God in your distress. Verse 28. Yeah, that's it, Pastor. Psalm 107, verse 28. Nice. Read that whole psalm. Not the same. Read the whole psalm later. But, but uh, they reeled and staggered like a drunken man, verse 27 said, and were at their wit's end. Verse 28, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still, so the waves of the sea were hushed, and they were glad because they were quiet, so he guided them to a safe haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Amen. God hears prayer. God answers prayer. And sometimes he answers prayer even beyond our, you know, you haven't heard that slogan or that slave phrase, phrase, beyond our wildest dreams, beyond our expectations. I love Jeremiah 33 3 when he says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. And then in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, we think about God doing above and beyond all, but anything that we can imagine, or anything that we could think of, if his people would humble themselves and cry out to him and seek his face. Now to him, Ephesians 3, 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So, in calling his people to prayer and repentance, we see that God hears. And really, the parallel, there's a great parallel there in 2 Chronicles 17. If you look at the, um, the nation of Israel, they were to be God's people. Who's God's people today? Who's the true Israel today? Those who are saved, those who are born again believers in Christ. And the correlation there between their disobedience and their turning their back 
on the Lord and the disobedience of not of the Republicans, not of the Democrats, not of the Senate, not of the Congress, but of God's people who have turned their back on him in some way, in some measure. And um, the call to return, which we're going to look at a little bit more here. But in calling his people to prayer and repentance, we see God hears and God forgives. It says in verse 2 Chronicles 7, 14, says, And turn from my wicked ways. There's the repentance that comes. Uh, the Bible's rich in describing man's responsibility of repentance. And you see the promise at the end of this verse. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Is our country, is our nation in need of healing? And the Savior is who? Jesus Christ. Um, if my people pray and humble themselves, I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. That word heal, you know, refers to coming to a physician for a cure, to be made whole. And we know what we need the Lord to heal our land, to heal our hearts. Hopefully we see our need for God's Forgiveness. Again, it's easy to watch all the stuff that's going on and uh, all the unrest and all the uh, division. And I'm reading in the paper, you know, not the paper, you know, maybe it's the paper. I'm reading on my, on my phone or, you know, this city, highest crime rate in history, 117, going up 117%. Homicides and shooting and gunfire because all the lawlessness that's uh, out there and, um, and all the unrest that's out there and then the plague and uh, all the division that is out there. Again, we need the Lord to intervene. We need Him to forgive our sin, heal our land. We need to see our need as a people and as a church for repentance. Forgive their sin, heal their land. I hope we want that individually, collectively. We see our need for that. God wants to forgive his people of their sin. God is ready to forgive. It's always that way. That's a wonderful thing. Unsaved person, God is ready to save you and forgive you today, this morning. If you would but bow your knee and turn your heart to him and repentance and faith and the unrest that's in your heart and the unhappiness that's in your soul. He would heal it. I promise you that. Amen. He would heal it. Amen. You have to go to the great physician for the cure. Christ. Amen. Right? You can't go to your friends. You can't go to... Psychologists. The pitfalls that are out there. You've got to go to the Lord. So in calling his people to prayer and repentance, we see he hears. God, he hears. He forgives. He heals. God forgives the sin of his people. He heals them. He restores them to himself. He heals and forgives nation. And that if you look at that, verse 14, again, the conditions, even here for um, national forgiveness, if you could put it that way, or personal forgiveness, it's the same, includes humility. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, and then and pray and seek my face, that... That, that's like there's a longing for the presence of God. There's a recognition of a need for the presence of God there. A longing for His presence. You know, if you look in 2 Chronicles 7, 19-22, there's a warning there, a big time warning, a sober warning to God's unrepentant people, to His unrepentant church. But if you turn, verse 19, away, so turn toward the Lord, turn away from your wickedness. If you turn, but it said, if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I've set before you, and you go and serve other gods and worship them, I mean, we even as, we as God's people, we are idolatrous by nature. We could go and worship and serve other gods, God of pleasure, God of comfort, God of ease, God of all these different things. 
If you go and serve and worship those gods, then I will uproot you from my land, which I had given to you. And he had given the Israelites the land of Canaan. And this house which I have consecrated for my name, I'll cast out of my sight, and I'll make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And yes, there's parallels there, right, between the nation of Israel, between us as God's people, and there's application, I'll put it that way, for us as America, as a country. As for this house which was exalted, anyone who passes by will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? And they will say, because they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them from the land of Egypt, and they adopted other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore he has brought all this adversity on them. So, Whatever is going on out here today in our world, in our society, in our culture, in our nation, whatever is going on in your life, in my life personally, whatever in this instance adversity that there is that's going on, he says he brought it upon them. He brings it upon us for the purpose of driving his people to himself and for the purpose of driving the unrepentant, unsaved person to Himself. Second Chronicles 6, verses 37 through 39, more about that judgment and um, warning, sober warning. Second Chronicles 6, 37 through 39, if they take thought in the land where they are taken captive and repent, and make supplication to you in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, we have committed iniquity, and have acted wickedly. If they return to you, with all their heart and with all their soul. What's that sound like? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and your neighbor as yourself, and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, where they have been taken captive, and pray toward their land which you have given to their fathers, and the city which you've chosen, and toward the house which I have built for your name. Then hear from heaven, from your dwelling place, their prayer and supplications and maintain their cause. So this is Solomon and praying for the nation of Israel. Hear from heaven and maintain their cause and forgive this. It's almost like he's praying there for what was coming and what was going to happen to the people, and he's reminding God of his faithfulness, and if God's, if, if God's people would turn and repent, that God would move, and that God would forgive that God would heal and my people if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven forgive their sin and heal their land so let's think about here a moment how we apply this okay first of all for sure God's people God's church, we're called to repent. Revelation chapter 3, verse 2. See, in the midst of everything that we have going on, you have a very, you know, and the closing quote, if I remember, is the one I'm trying to decide which one I was going to pick. But it says about what the condition is of the church today. And, um, the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in some instances, our weakness. And in some instances, our turning our back on the Lord. And in some instances, uh, just a lot of crazy things that go on, uh, even in midst of, quote, evangelical churches that um, there needs to be repentance for. And then personally, but Revelation 3 2 applies to these are the letters to the seven churches. And we had a sermon series on this, I don't know, I don't remember when it was, but where he tells the church at Sardis there, and he tells the people of God there, what does he tell them in Revelation 3 2? Wake up! <laughs> Sleepy Christians. He says, Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you've received and heard and keep it and repent. 
Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. And how that can happen, right? And how that is happening, can happen to churches, that could happen to us in our country as a nation, waking up, the need for God's church and God's people to wake up. And God will use the political climate of this day, and the particular event that certain in the political world have, to bring his judgment upon the church, uh, upon God's people. And the admonition here for God's people is to wake up. Verses 14 and 16. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen and the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich, I become wealthy, I don't need anything, and you don't know that you are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. And so that describes the church. That describes people in the church. It says there, they're like neither hot nor cold. They got a little bit of hotness at certain times, but overall they're lukewarm, they're take it or leave it, Christians, um, I called it hokey pokey Christianity. I got another new one now. They're the drive by Christians. Hey, hi. Oh, I'm doing great. Yeah, hi. How are you? Just kind of drive by, show up to certain things here or there. Hey, hey I'm good. What I'm saying, yeah, I'm good. It's like, don't get anywhere near me because I don't want to go any further than I'm just good. I'm okay. Yeah, how are you? Oh, I'm good. Okay, yeah, good. See you next week. Maybe. You know, the drive-by kind of uh, mentality there. So God's people, God's church, we need to repent. God's judgment will come on the, on the church, will come on the country, will come on a nation. We don't know when that will come. Maybe it's coming right now. Maybe it's coming down the road. But the need of the hour is always for us as children of God to repent of our lukewarmness of our take it or leave it kind of attitude. Second way of thinking about applying if my people and the need for repentance. Have you, this is to the unsaved, this is to the not yet believer in Jesus Christ. Have you humbled yourself and turned to the Lord of repentance to be saved? Have you humbled yourself and turned to the Lord in repentance to be saved? Have you? Because there's only... Um, I remember watching the movie uh, Fireproof and uh, the character there played by Kirk Cameron the fire chief you know um, he was an unsaved man and then the Lord broke him and he was saved and uh, he was repentant and um, in that movie you know how they you knew he was repentant he took his big huge computer that he big huge computer that was that he was looking at pornography on, and he took it outside and he put it in the garbage can. And he just he didn't take the. I was wondering again why he didn't take the hard drive out and have it, you know, just wiped clean. But he just he was happy with just taking it out and smashing it to pieces with a baseball bat. And he put flowers in the place of where the computer was with a note to his wife, who was they were about to get divorced. They ended up, ended up getting divorced with a note to his wife, who knew that that's where his heart was. And she, he said, I loved you. How do you say it? I, I love you more. Because I love you more. Beautiful bouquet of roses there. And the computer gone, right? And a repentant man. And so, in, in that one of the other scenes in the movie, he's talking to his friend, and his friend goes, he goes, you know your faith? He's saying to his buddy, he goes, I'm in. And the guy goes, what do you mean you're in? He goes, you can't be halfway in. You're either all the way in or in. He goes, I'm in. I'm a believer now in Jesus Christ and the fruit of that repentance being demonstrated. So have you humbled yourself and turned to the Lord of repentance is question A. And then the other part of that question, you either have done that or you're hardening, presently hardening, today even hardening. If you're listening to this or watching this or listening to it at all, 
you're either repentant, you've turned to the Lord in repentance and faith to be saved, or you're turning to the Lord in repentance and faith to be saved, or literally, as my words are being spoken, you're literally still hardening your heart against the Lord. That's right, the only two places. I think it was like a year ago, I went for um, one of these cholesterol screen, screening things where you go through the machine and they can measure like the plaque that's like in your heart and in your heart, mostly it's like in your heart because that's what the cholesterol does. It brings about, you know, the, uh, the, the clogging of the arteries. An unsaved person, uh, it's like their heart is being hardened, continually hardened. And the buildup of the sin in their life is hardening those arteries and closing them uh, to the things of the Lord to the point ultimately where they'll be given over to the point. The Bible actually says in Hebrews, there's a point of just being given over where there's no hope. There's no hope. There's still hope for people right now, but there'll be a point, spiritually speaking, and only God knows when their heart becomes so hard that they're at that point it's like they've just given themselves over. So are you turning to the Lord and you turn to the Lord repentance, or are you hardening your heart against the Lord? I love Isaiah 45, 22. I've quoted it, you know, so many times when he says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Turn to me and be saved. Turn to me today and be saved. For there is one God, there is no other. And then, or are you hardening your heart? Right? Let me read Hebrews 3, verse 8. Don't harden your hearts as when they provoke me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Verse 15. While it is said, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as when they provoked me. And then, chapter 4, verse 7. For again, he fixes a certain day today, saying to David, after so long a time, just as he's been said before, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. You can say, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart, because you don't know when there'll be a point where your heart is so hardened. Or you don't know if you'll have another opportunity to turn to the Lord of repentance and faith and be saved. Because no one knows how long they're going to be living, right? You just don't know. So, turn to the Lord today. Turn to the Lord and be saved today. Then, as we think about, for us as a children of God, as a people of God, we really do need to call upon, let's call upon God in prayer for our country, for our nation, for all that's going on around us. I did love that prayer, prayer march that, that, that I saw there on TV and that we all, those that could sit here and participate, and some of you were watching or listening or doing at home or, or, or just praying for the nation. I encourage you, Go back soon if you haven't seen it, and go back and look at that link um, and pray through that with them. Don't you love Psalm 50, verse 15? Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will honor me. So that's the need of the hour. Call upon me. Call upon God in prayer. Call upon God in prayer for our country. In the original words, what do you mean? Cry out to God. Like just out of a sense of desperation. Uh, recognizing our need. It's a critical need or a chronic need. Psalm 34, verse 6 says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his trouble. Amen. So you see a church call out to the Lord. And brothers and sisters in Christ, Franklin Graham put it this way, I would agree with him. Our nation, our country, is in trouble. And I'm trying to you know, bring this across to us all, recognizing the need of the hour, recognizing God's remedy for our country and our promise to his people without making it a political sermon. Okay? It's hard to separate it totally in light of uh, the differences that exist there and one path versus another path for uh, the country. He says, I shall rescue you and you shall honor me. So again, we see our need here for God. Y'all with me? Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Isaiah 64 says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains may quake at your presence, 
if as fire kindles the brushwood, as fire causes waters to boil, to make your name known that your adversaries, amongst your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. I like verse 3, when you did awesome things which we did not expect. You came down the mountains quake at your presence. This is a prayer from Isaiah for revival. This is a prayer from Isaiah for um, the needs of the nation, the needs of the people, the needs of the nation of Israel. He says, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. There's great emotion being expressed there. Rend means to like just tear open, just to tear apart. It's for divine in intervention of God that Isaiah prays. And we need to pray for divine intervention of God on this country, all the unrest, all the division, all the discord, and that, um, that the Lord would intervene. Forgive our sin and heal our land. Is not this our greatest need? Personally, for the Lord to heal us and to touch us and forgive us, is it not our greatest need as a church and as a nation? So, God calls His people to prayer and repentance. He hears, He forgives, He heals. So what is my response going to be to God's call to prayer and repentance? And what's our church's response? What is the church of God's response going to be to God's call to prayer and repentance? Alright, so we're kind of rolling, wrapping up here. This is like the final exhortation point and the celebration of Jesus point. Have you repented of your sin and called upon Jesus to save you? Have you called upon him for salvation? Do you belong to him? Again, the Bible promises everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord in Romans 10, 13 will be saved. And so the encouragement and the admonition there is for you to turn to him if you haven't today to be saved. Or harden your heart further against the Lord. But the Bible says today is the day to be saved. Then for children of God, Sandy asked me, what are you doing with Mr. Potato Head? Remember Kenny when, is Kenny back there? Mm -hmm. Kenny, remember maybe you and I were making a Mr. Potato Head yesterday. He made one. He used one that had really big ears, which is, um, I should have used the one with really big ears. I, I, I think I've used this illustration here before as it relates to good old Mr. Potato Head. Now he's plastic. In my day, he was a real potato. <laughs> and, um, and now he's plastic. But anyways, let's be Mr. Potato Head Christians in the sense that Isaiah 64, 4 says this. Since ancient times, no one has heard, nor ear, touch your ear, no ear, no ear has perceived, and your eye, no eye has seen any God beside you, God, who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. So in that sense, you know, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God will do on behalf of those who cry out to him, on behalf of those who turn to him in repentance, on behalf of those who seek him for personal revival, who seek them for uh, cleansing of their sin, that they will be more like Christ, who do those things that they could do that could help them in their Christian life and in their Christian walk and that whole putting off of sin and putting on Christ. No eye has seen God. No eye, no eye. It has yet to even be anywhere closely seen what God will do in the lives of his people. In your life personally, in my life personally, in our life collectively. It, it's, it's beyond what we've seen so far and beyond what we've heard so far of what God will do on behalf of a people who will cry out to him on behalf of the people who will be all in, all, all in for him, on behalf of the people who will, we sang surrender. I have, a, I shudder whenever we have to sing the song I surrender all. I can sing, I can sing it for darnies. I surrender all to you. I surrender. Yeah, do it. Right? Only through the power of the Spirit, only through the help of the Lord, only out of a sense of desperation and out of a desperate need, and out of a sense of brokenness. So let's be Mr. Potato Head kind of Christians in the sense that we want to see what we've not seen before. We pray that all the time. I can say every Friday we pray, Lord, help us to see on Sunday something that we've not seen of you before. 
when we gather together corporately to worship. That's why I always say, and I say it sometimes in the appetizer too, it's like, it's like, we're not here for whatever reason. You don't know. We don't know what we may miss that one particular moment in time when we're gathered together with God's people. All right, so let's be Mr. Potato Head Christians. And then, hopefully, we'll have an understanding, Lord, help us have an understanding and appreciation of the privilege and the blessing and the responsibility we have to pray. Will we commit to pray for our country? There's a lot of stake right now. And there's a lot of stake in this election. Will we be in prayer over the next weeks and leading up to the election? Will we pray for the unrest? Will we pray for the division? Will we pray for the ungodly influences over our country? Will we pray for the advancement of the gospel in the kingdom of God in these turbulent times? Scripture gives us all those incentives. I read just a few earlier for prayer. But check this out. Revelation 5.8. We want to be Mr. Potato Head Christians. And this is a golden bowl, okay? I found it in the back. It's a golden bowl. Bowl. I don't think it's really gold. It looks as it's close as I could get to a golden bowl. Bowl. Revelation 5, verse 8, as it relates to the golden bowl and the prayers of God's people. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Even in heaven, right, there's that. There's these golden bowls filled of the prayers of God's saints and what we prayed for and how we prayed. Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer, which the prayer which were the prayers, which were the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And imagine this in heaven, the smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. That's just awesome. Think about the prayer and the, and, and the power of prayer and, and the, the changing effect that prayer could have and the, the life-changing effect that prayer could have. You know, you face situations, I face situations right now, and it's like I'm trying to work in a situation and trying to help in the situation, and it's like, you all know that there's, there's things that you're facing that it's like, if God doesn't move, and if God doesn't work, and if God doesn't act, it's not going to happen. Whatever it is maybe that you're praying for, right? That's like one of those impossible situations, right? Um, we could give millions of examples, right? But can we pray more? Yes. Should we pray more? Yes. Do we need to pray more? Yes. We, we would all agree to that. Think about your prayers, our prayers, being offered up as uh, incense unto God. So, what an incentive, what a blessed incentive that is. All right, now that's all positive. This next quote is a little negative. Sorry, I like to end on a totally high note, but okay, Dan, give me the quote for the week. John Stott said, Our Christianity is flabby and anemic, and we appear to take in a lukewarm bath of religion. And that's not saying all of you are lukewarm or that we're off, that I'm lukewarm or that the church is lukewarm. But there's times when we are, you know, a little lukewarm. There's times when we have forsaken our first love. And we got this admonition about hearing things and seeing things that we've not seen before. God, we have not yet seen what God will do on behalf of the prayers of his people. So let's pray more and offer those sacrifices, and offer those that incense up to the Lord. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and heal their land. And that's a promise from God. So Lord Jesus, we just thank you and praise you uh, for that wonderful, 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 glorious, glorious promise from you. The promise to forgive, to heal, a repentant people and a repentant church. And we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, amen.